Good morning, everybody. The third reading of Parshas Vayigash. The tearful reunion continues. You must now understand, says Yosef. You didn't send me here. Hey, no. This is all from God. In other words, don't feel bad. Don't get nervous. Don't get upset. Don't be ashamed. Forget about what. This is all a divine plan. God has sent me here and he placed me as a father figure for the Pharaoh. Ula Odin is a master for all of his household. <coughs> and a ruler over all of the land of Egypt. Thus begins the third reading of Parshat Vayigash, chapter 45, verse 8. Love for a father. Says Rashi, this could be understood in a euphemistic terminology, not literally as a father, but rather what's called in Latin a, a patron. Lachover or le patron. Sort of a, um, a, 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 a friendly figure, a, a patron figure, who was going to provide for the Pharaoh. The Ipsad Yigoran says la'av means can mean like a rav, like a teacher, or even as he uses the word murder. The Sepharna says it means it's like giving advice. At any rate, he's certainly not in charge of the Pharaoh, but he becomes a, a person who's very dear and very near to the Pharaoh. Pharaoh needs him. He has a very important role to play. And so, because that's the case, because Hashem is the one who sent me, and really this is not you. So right now, instead of focusing on that, you should, not, right now is, now is time to focus on bring the family down. That's, that's what you should focus on. Maharu, go quickly. Va'alu alavi, go up to my father. Va'amar to my love, and this is exactly what you should tell him. Koi omar bincha Yosef. This is what your son Joseph said. So mani alikim la'odin l'chol mitzrayim. God has placed me as a master over all of Egypt. The day I come down to me, al tamid, don't remain in your place. Don't stop. Don't think twice. Just come on down. So God has placed me as a master over all of Egypt. I am responsible for everything that happens in this country, as the Zephorno says. Maharu va'alu, quickly. So the Zephorno says he shouldn't have any pain anymore. He said, so much pain, so much suffering, the anxiety of separation. Make it fast. Redei Eli, why does it say Redei? It should say Rad. And the Chaskuni says, this is because there's already a year, really it says Redu. Redu was what, was what, the fa- what uh, Jacob said. He said to his children, Redu, go down. Resh Dalad Vav. Redu is as a gematria of, Resh is 200, Dalad is four, and Vav is six. six. So he says, now it's only the day. Already one year is almost gone already. It's only going to be now, not 210 years, but 209 years. Mm. So just, just make it down. Let's, let's get down quickly. At any rate, he says, you come down. The Rebbe one time explained that Somani Alekim lo Adno Mitzayim and the deeper messages, Yosef was saying, Somani Alekim, I place God as Adno Mitzayim. In other words, I brought morality into this country. I know you don't want to come here, I know you're afraid, but you know, I gave everybody a bris I kind of cleaned up their act, I made them a little more focused. It's not as licentious a country as you thought it was or as it used to be. And, and therefore, you should come down where should you come? The Yashafta, it's Gaishan. You live in the land of Gaishan. Vayisa Korivila, you'll be close to me. Ata, you, Vanecha, your children, Vanevanecha, your grandchildren. Seincho, Vakarcha, your sheep, your cattle, Vachola Shalach. There'll be room for everything. So just come on down. Now, this is interesting. Why is Yasef giving him the details of the neighborhood? Jacob has never been in Egypt. He was indeed outside of Israel, but he was in Kurdistan. He headed up to Iraq. I'm not Arayim. He wasn't, he wasn't a Mitzrayim. Avram Vino was a Mitzrayim. Yitzchak never left. And Yaakov was never there. So why is he giving him details of the neighborhood? So the Pirke that Rebbe Lezer says something fascinating. What, he said Goshen specifically? You see. He says, V'yashav to Goshen. He's giving him an address. You'll live in this neighborhood. What was that mean to him? He was never there. As opposed to Beretz Mitzrayim? Like... Well, it, it is Yishav to Be'eretz Gershon, which is Karav Eli. First of all, he says, come down to Eretz Mitzrayim. He says, you'll be close to me. But in between, he inserts like the coordinates. Here's exactly where you're going to live. You'll settle into this land, the place called Goshen. Why would that be appealing to Yaakov? He's trying to get him to come down quickly. He says, come, don't worry, you'll live in Goshen. So the Pirkei Rebbe Lezer says something unbelievable. When the Pharaoh took Sarah Imenu 
and he was planning to marry her, you can't just marry a commoner. First, he had to create some kind of lineage, you know, like La Havdil, when the, uh, when the British uh, royal family marries somebody, especially if he's a crown prince, they have to first give the, 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 the princess a name. If they make her first into a princess, they give her a name. What did they call Diana? I forget already. What was it? Was, uh, York, Duchess of York. Duchess of York. Well, I don't know what that means, but <laughs> she was Duchess of York. Okay. Right? And I figured York is a place. <laughs> we live in York region. <laughs> right? So the Duchess of York or Duchess of Sussex, you know, you create, as if you create some kind of background. So, so the royal, the crown prince is not marrying a commoner, now he's marrying a royal. So the pharaoh gave Sarah a title. He officially put, placed her in charge of Goshen. This is a very beautiful, fertile area. He, he called her Duchess of Goshen. And then after he called her Duchess of Goshen, there was a period. Avram Avinu and Sarah were actually in Mitzrayim for six months. So it, it didn't happen overnight. You read it in the Chumash, it happens very quickly, but it was an extended period of time, or at least three months at least. Three months for sure, I think Rashi says. So during that time, Sarah was named Duchess of Goshen. So she actually was, on paper, the ruler of this area. And so Yaakov knew that in the family, uh, Yosef knew in the family that they, they, everybody knew the name Goshen. Goshen was the place that belonged to us. Sarah Imenu had an influence there. When you have a tzidkan, it's like Sarah Imenu, and there's a, poor, a piece of geography that's attributed to her, automatically it mitigates the negative spiritual influences. So this is how Yosef kind of enticed his father to come. He said, you come to the land of Goshen. And he figured, Yaakov said, oh, Goshen, right, that's my grandmother's uh, area. That's, that's, Sarah is the Duchess of Goshen. In the words of the Perkei de Belezim, from that time and onward, there was the merit of Sarah that brought holiness into this place. At any rate, this is, the, this is where you're going to live, and it's going to be great. You're going to have everything will be taken care of. Everything's going to be fine. I will take care of you. There's another five years of incredible famine. Penti Vadesh, lest you become entirely impoverished. Ata Oveischa Vachala Shalach, you and your household and everything that is to you. Rashi says, What is the meaning of Penti Vadesh? She says, This is, you look in the Unculus, Unculus renders it, Dilma Tismaskan, lest you become uh, impoverished or poor. Because the word Rosh comes from the word Ani. So, Loshan Moirish. This comes to the terminology in which HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it says, makes you either poor or rich. So ma'ashir comes to the word ashir, means rich. Ma'irish means to impoverish or to drain you of wealth or affluence. So he says you will become drained. You'll lose all of your residuals. Of course, there'll be nothing to eat. You have to spend everything on trying to get a, a loaf of bread and then there'll be nothing left. And so, in this way, Yosef hopes his father will not stop for a moment and he will head straight down to the land of Mitzrayim. The Baal HaTurim says something very interesting. He suggests that Tivarish means impoverished not from food, but from Torah. We know the Mishnah says, Ein Kemach, Ein Torah. There's no food to eat. Who's going to have time to learn Torah? So he says you'll be so concerned with survival, you'll have no time for spiritual pursuit. Whereas the Maggid of Mizit said, a klein alechel in guf is a grace alechel in neshama. A grace alech in neshama. A little hole, a little deficiency in the body, he said, amounts to a large gaping hole in the neshama. Because if you don't have your bodily and material reality set up, how do you pursue spirituality? So tivarish means it's not just impoverished on a, on a literal sense, in a material sense, but tivarish means impoverished in a, in a spiritual sense. And this is really, Yosef knows going to get Yaakov's attention. He knows his father, right? <laughs> He's not, going to, he's not going to impress him with, with a Cadillac. He's not going to be able to excite him with a, a beautiful home in Beverly Hills or the bridal path. But he tells him, you're going to be Tismaskin, Tivarish. You'll become impoverished spiritually. Now he has his attention. Didn't Yaakov know in advance that he was going to have to go down there? Did Yaakov know in advance he's going to have to go down there? The answer to that question principally is yes. Principally, although I'm not 100% sure. He didn't say you're going to go to the land of Egypt. So you go to a land that is not yours. But so what? You know, like uh, you, could know, you can be aware of something principally. You know, you have to go somewhere eventually. But why should I go now? Why, should, why begin this process now? So Yosef is making a very strong case. It's five more years. There'll be famine. We will not be able to survive. You need to come now. Now I can take care of you. Just come down. Now, of course, there's the concern that the brothers of Yosef think this is a trap. He's trying to do something to them. 
he's going to get them back now. <laughs> and so Yosef addresses this next. He says, your eyes see. And your my the eyes of my brother Binyamin. You see, I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to you in Hebrew. You see, I still have the family values. Eh? I care about Binyamin. Do I have anything against Binyamin? I have nothing against you. Don't worry about that. Just me, me and you, me and Binyamin, it's all the same. We're all good. You just come down. Rashi says, you see, number one, Bechvaydi. Number one, you see the glory, the honor I have. So why would I be angry at you? It's thanks to you I got all this. I owe you. <laughs> and you see, Shani Achechem. You see, I am your brother. Shani Mol Bechachem. We learned yesterday's Chumash that Yosef showed that he was circumcised. You see that I'm speaking to you, Balashna Kedish. I'm still fluent in Hebrew. I'm, we're on the same page. Don't worry about this. Rashi says, He made them all, he equated them to Binyamin. As if to say, Just as I have no anger, no hatred, no animosity, I don't have a grudge against my brother Binyamin. He wasn't even there. How could you have a grudge against him? So too. I have no hatred to you. I have no hatred to you. It's obvious I have no hatred to Binyamin. I have no hatred to you either. Same thing. It's no difference. And as such, you have no reason to be concerned whatsoever. Now, it's interesting that um, Yeshua talks about the eyes. He says, Einechem Rois, and, and the Eine Achi Binyamin. He does talk so much about the eyes, the eye, your eyes see, my eyes see. So the Yehuda Chalva says something very interesting. He says, we know that the difference between Rachel and Leah was the eyes. They were identical twins, actually, as we learned. They had the same build. They looked, they looked the same, same gait. They looked just about the same. But the eyes were the difference. And of course, Leah was veiled, so he couldn't see the eyes. And then it was dark, he couldn't see the eyes. So it's likely and plausible that Yosef and Binyamin looked like, looked like, like, like uh, Rachel and they had those eyes. She was Yefei and Naim. She had beautiful eyes. So he said, he said, he emphasizes, you see, I'm really your brother. I look exact. Look, our eyes are identical. <laughs> look, look at the eyes of Binyamin. You see the way we're identical? That's what, that's what Yehuda Chalva Chalava says. Interesting. Chizkuni uh, kind of takes it in a different direction. He says, why did nobody ever tell Yaakov what happened? Because they made an oath. And they made a minion in their oath. The problem was they only had nine in their minion. Who is their tenth? God. And that's what God didn't tell. So Yosef was saying, don't worry about saying anything. Don't worry. If you're worried about how to tell our father I ended up here, let Binyamin do the talking. He does, he doesn't, he's not bound by any oath. Was, Yosef is not suggesting you have to say you sold me. But however you're going to do this, if you're going to say we, we, can't, we can't break our confidence, we can, Binyamin will tell so there's this idea that he places importance over uh, on Binyamin insofar as the message that will be passed on. At any rate, the bottom line is, you should tell him. It's called Kvaydi B'Mitzrayim, tell him with all the glory, all the honor. It's called Asharatim Reim, everything you see. Umihartem, Vairadtem, Esavi Heina. Just hurry up and bring my father down here. And at this point, when Yosef goes ahead and he makes his case, and he says you should bring my father down here, Immediately, at this point, something very interesting happens. Now there's an actual embrace, and it's a tearful embrace. Yosef falls on the neck of Binyamin, his brother, and he weeps. And Binyamin responds in like fashion. Binyamin, in turn, cries on the neck of Yosef. Now this business of neck and neck is kind of strange. The whole business with a neck does not have to show up altogether. It could just say, He fell. He embraced his brother. And he cried. No question. Binyamin Bacha, Allah. Binyamin cried over him. They embraced and they wept. In fact, if you were describing this scene to anybody, I very much doubt that you would have remembered to include the business of the neck. He fell on the neck and cried on the neck. You just say he cried. They embraced and they cried. So why does the Torah have to emphasize the idea of a neck? And it says it twice. Binyamin, Yosef embraces Binyamin's neck. Binyamin, he falls on Binyamin's neck. I don't even know what that looks like. Right? Falls on the neck. And then Binyamin 
is Bacha is crying al Tzavarav on his neck. I heard of crying on my shoulder. I never heard of crying on my neck. What does this mean? So because it's such an odd and unusual expression, Rashi, Rashi actually reaches for a very unusual medrash. And he says that do not read this crying as a typical tearful reunion, even though that's naturally what you would think it was. This doesn't, on the surface, look extraordinary. So no, no surprises here. So we never believe what happened in verse 14. What happened? They embraced and they wept. That's, that's, like, that's so anticipated. If they wouldn't embrace and weep, it would be a question. But the fact that the Torah just describes the details of this embrace and emphasizes neck and neck both times, this is what impels Rashi to say, Al Shnei Migdoshes. Do you know why they were crying? They were crying on two Batei Migdash. Sha'asid and Lias Bechelko Shabinyamin. That was going to be in the portion of Binyamin. The base of Migdash, of course, in Yerushalayim. It's surrounded by the area of Yehuda, but this little peninsula juts out from Binyamin's property, from Binyamin's area territory, and that's where the base of Migdash was. So, this is this is what the Asif was crying about. Binyamin, then, what was he crying about? Binyamin Bach al Tzavarav al Mishkan Shiloi. For 369 years, the Mishkan stood in what the world calls the West Bank. <laughs> Shiloh. Shiloh was the Jewish. They say Jerusalem is not ours, okay? It's a, fits, it's a perfect pattern. They say Shiloh is not ours. Shiloh was the center of Jewish spiritual life for 369 years. It was a veritable base of Migdash, a stone, a stone structure. But in the end, that was destroyed. And even though we don't commemorate its destruction, because that was seen as a way station on the way to Yerushalayim, but nonetheless, it was a very traumatic event for the Jewish people at the time. And that was Asid li yes Yosef. That was in the portion of Yosef. And because it was in the portion of Yosef, the Seifel Yicharev, in the end, that would be destroyed. And Yosef would no longer be the seat of Jewish spirituality, the ground zero of holiness. So therefore, Binyamin was crying for Yosef. And that's why they're crying for Batei Migdash, and that's what the business of the neck represents. Each one's crying on a neck. And the neck then is Beis migdash like Now, the obvious question you could ask is that why is a neck a Beis migdash? So the Mepharshim explain that the neck is what connects the body with the head. And Yerushalayim, or the Beis migdash is the nexus that connects heaven and earth. It's like a neck. And there's much more to say about that. But I want to focus on something else this morning. And what I want to focus on, and open up now to page Reish Pegimel, a remarkable analysis from the Rebbe on this Rashi. In the same edited talk, the Rebbe speaks about the business of a neck, which we'll not focus on. But instead, the Rebbe asks a simple question. In the Gemara Masech Sanhedrin, on page 9, the Talmud makes a very famous statement, a statement which has evoked a maxim which is used all the time. And the statement is, and I quote, Adam Karev Eitzel Atzmai. Which means, we are all partial when it comes to ourselves. Can you give testimony for a relative? Will your testimony be accepted? The answer is no. Why not? Because you are no longer impartial when it's a relative. So the moment that somebody that's related to you, we say, you are biased. Do not have the ability to be objective. And as such, you can't serve as a witness. And this goes to the nth degree. Oftentimes people are going to have a wedding and say, okay, I'd like my, my uh, family to be the witness. And that's not going to work. Why not? Who but family should be the witness? No, it doesn't work like that. The family can't be the witness because they're craven, because they're related. And who are we related to most closely of all? Or with whom do we have the greatest bias of all? The greatest bias of all, ourselves. <laughs> We're close to ourselves. In other words, none of us really see ourselves in the truest light. We have, we have a, a, a flattering version of ourselves, which, which we like to see. Right? We don't know how, 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 how we really look. You see, how, you see how we imagine ourselves to be. And that's why when we have deficiencies, we minimize them. And when we have... We have Exemplary qualities, we magnify them. We keep talking about our virtues. We're impressed with our virtues. Even if we're ashamed to talk about it to other people, we don't think it's polite. We think to ourselves our virtues are great. 
And our deficiency, well, you know, if somebody else will be in my position, they do worse. This, incidentally, says the Tzermach Tzedek, is the meaning of the Ahavta, you should love Riyacha, your fellow, Komeicha, like yourself. What does it mean to love your fellow like yourself? It means in the same way that you mitigate your own deficiencies and you magnify your own virtues, when you look at another Yid, magnify his or her virtues and minimize their deficiencies. So what Adam cultivates a lot, we're always closest to ourselves. In, in plain English, who do we care about most? We care about number one. That's, it's not a bad thing. It, it's a fact. It's a matter of fact. A baby doesn't know how to care about anybody but himself. <coughs> what do you want? He's a baby. The baby knows how to cry and weep and scream and demand and yell and only thinks about itself. The older we get, the more menschlich we get, the more, more sensitive, more compassionate. We should learn how to care about other people also. But ultimately, we care about ourselves. That's why Hillel said, Mada Allah Sani, what you detest, what you dislike, don't do to somebody else. That's the benchmark. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Treat others the way you want, the way you treat yourself. So in that case, if there's a two button Migdash to cry for, we could cry for Shiloh or cry for Yerushalayim. You are Yosef, Shiloh is in your backyard. Who are you going to cry for? You're going to cry for Shiloh. You're Binyamin, and Moria is in your backyard. Who are you going to cry for? For yourself. It isn't as if Yosef didn't have a base Hamidus to cry for. He did, and Binyamin was crying for it. It isn't as if Binyamin didn't have a base Hamidus to cry for. He did, and Yosef is crying for it. So the Rebbe has a simple question. Why is Yosef crying? For Binyamin's sorrow. Binyamin, conversely, is Binyamin's only crying for the sadness of Yosef. Truth be told, the loss of the Beis Hamikdash is much more traumatic than the loss of Shiloh. It is seared into our national memory in a much more indelible way. Most people don't even know about Shiloh. We don't know the date that it was destroyed. We don't commemorate in any way, shape, or form. If you want to talk about a tragedy, if you want to talk about a loss, if you want to talk about a tremendous uh, assault to the soul and psyche of the Jewish people, the loss of Yerushalayim would be it. So, so it's no, no contest. Why is he crying about Shiloh? Cry about, they should both cry about the Beis HaMikdash. In other words, even if the neck means the Beis HaMikdash, they have two Bata Migdash to cry about. If you want to divide it evenly, Yosef can cry about the first base of Migdash, Binyam can cry about the second base of Migdash. Okay, that way can, we can cover everybody with his. We get everybody covered. If you, if you have to cry about something else. So the Rebbe says something absolutely incredible, which is so pertinent and so relevant in our own life. Let's talk about tears. A person cries. Why does a person cry? What is accomplished with tears? It's because, if you think about it, tears cannot change anything. Before you cried, you felt horrible. After you cried, you felt better. What changed? Nothing. Zilch, nada. Nothing changed. So why do you feel better? I'll tell you why you feel better. Because that's what tears do. Tears are a release. There's pent-up emotion. That emotion, as it's pent up, as it builds, causes pain, and then you release it, somehow you feel better. It didn't do anything. It's lahakalala adam. It makes things a little lighter, a little easier. It, it lessens the burden. It just soothes a person, that's all. That's all tears do. And therefore, and therefore, my friends, if there's something to do, im yeshna if there's something that can be fixed, if there's something that can be done, what are you crying for? In Makam Lebechi, there's no room for tears. Eloyesh Linkait, instead, you should seize the opportunity and do Pu'ula Maisis. Do something. Do something. Letaken es haton tikon, whatever it is that needs to be fixed or rectified, go do it. As the Rebbe Rashab famously said, Toiva Pu'ula Achas. A single deed, he said, is better than Elof Anochis and a thousand sighs. But we are the masters of kvetching and sighing. We kvetch and sigh and wring our hands. What are you doing? Do something. A tragedy happens, everybody sends thoughts and prayers. Facebook is full of thoughts and prayers. And we make tear faces. Who did you help? Who did you? Who? Who? Nobody. You feel better. 
You feel better because you pushed with your finger for a nanosecond. You pushed a tear face and you wrote, and it took three seconds to write my tears and prayers. What was accomplished? So the person says, what do you want me to do? Something. You can always do something. You see, your Beis Hamikdash is destroyed. And the Beis Hamikdash represents proverbially the idea of the Shekhinah residing within your own psyche, within your own persona. You see, it's destroyed. Don't start fetching and sighing and weeping and crying. Do something. You have to use martial every ounce of strength. Do everything you possibly could. To rebuild and reconstitute the Beis Hamikdash in your soul, in your heart, in your mind. Guess what? When you rebuild your Beis Hamikdash, that necessarily contributes towards the building of the big Beis Hamikdash. You feel destruction, you feel desolateness, emptiness in your life. Fill it. Do something. When are tears appropriate? You see a, a friend, a companion, a peer, a fellow, and this person is in a terrible shape, and they don't want to listen to you. And they refuse to hear what you have to say. And they're not interested in any help. So that's at that point, that's when you can cry. You have nothing else to do. Okay, at least care. At least show you care. At least cry. Because, who really can save a situation? The person themselves. You can't fix somebody else's problems. You could try to help them. But they have to want to be helped. And if they don't want to be helped, all your efforts will be in vain. You can be there at their side as long as they themselves are ready to do some of the heavy lifting. And if a person is unwilling to do any heavy lifting whatsoever, but they want somebody to wave a wand and make magic and fix the situation, then you can set a tear. Because that shows at least you care. So when Yosef is looking at Binyamin's destruction, what could he do for Binyamin? Binyamin has to fix his own problems. What could Yosef do? He could empathize. He could sympathize. He could shed a tear. Although, of course, he's supposed to help. The Rebbe says, without a question, he has to help his friend. If it's whether giving him a little bit of a rebuke, a few sharp words, well placed in the right direction to push him along. Or to daven on his behalf. People say, I keep you in my prayers. Thank you. If, 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 you, if you're doing what you could and somebody else davens you, that actually could mean something. But that's what the proviso, that there's nothing else that can be done. At the end of the day, if somebody doesn't want to deal with their own problems, you can't fix that. You can't solve somebody else's problems. Then at least care. Then at least shed a tear. Then at least daven. But when it comes to your problems, your Beis HaMikdash, roll your sleeves up. Get to work and fix the situation. And that's the lesson we learn from the neck and neck, the weeping of Benyamin and Yosef during this tearful reunion.